Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. And today we are thrilled to welcome an incredibly versatile actor, one of my favorites, and someone who has basically been in just about everything and makes everything that much better for being in it, including the blockbuster Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, Once Upon a Time, and his Hebrew school production of David and Goliath. Please help us welcome Lee Ehrenberg. Lee, thanks so much for joining us. Ah, oh, it is my pleasure, my friends. <laughs> Uh, truly my honor. Um, and I, uh, you know, I like to say, respect your audience, respect yourselves. The fans make you in this business. Never forget that as a lesson I pass on to the young actors. So what a pleasure for me to be here. Thanks for asking me. I live in gratitude. And thanks to you, my friends, I live at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do want to start. I, I got to start because I read that. I thought it was fascinating with that Hebrew school production of David and Goliath. Hell yeah. <laughs> I read that you play David and that it helped make a passion for performing in you. As, so, as an eight-year-old. Right. How, that's what I want to ask. How old were you? And, and what do you remember that you made you love performing from that, from that experience? Oh, I remember it all, bro. <laughs> I remember being a kid with a Jufro and big glasses at an early age. And and I'm serious about this. It's about a lot of times we don't see, everyone sees themselves as an awkward person. Everyone has anxiety. Everyone goes through depression. It's, it's a human trait. But at eight years old, I realized that I was comfortable up there. That's good. Uh, that I, I had a gift to, to connect with people. Didn't know exactly what that was until many years later when I kind of was able to sit down and kind of decipher what it was that turned me on about being an actor. Um, but at eight years old, uh, you know, David kills Goliath. He's bound to be the hero. <laughs> I sang the song, got the standing ovation, and I was hooked. I mean, I admit to my narcissism. I admit to my ego. I battle it every freaking day, right? That's, but, and but that's the, rare. It's rare, but welcome. <laughs> well, uh, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, if you don't humble yourself, the world will humble you. Sure. So I, when I started the practice of daily gratitude, mm -hmm. of really waking up and being thankful for all the stuff that I have and not what I don't have, I was able to drop a lot of the BS okay. and it's part of the daily. It's how an artist can survive waiting for the phone to ring. You go from hero to zero so fast in the business. So how do you deal with the emotional body shots of trying to make it your career? How do you last when they keep telling, you no? when the doors close, when you're, when you're, it's not even being on a cold streak because a lot of the time, you know, you when you walk into an audition, you're either the guy or you're not the guy. Yep. So knowing that the casting directors want you to be the guy because their job is so difficult mm -hmm. is something I program into the equation. But going back to killing Goliath in Hebrew school, um, the fascinating thing was I grew up in Southern California and a member of our congregation was a great character actor called Harold Gould. Harold hmm. played Rhoda's dad. He was in the mm -hmm. sting, kid twist in the yeah. sting. And I can remember my dad. I don't, I'm not a Nepo baby. I grew up in SoCal, but I don't have the connection. So right. I might as well have been a million miles away. Cause my dream, even if you grow up across the street from the studio to get invited in, it's a million mile, you know, journey. But I remember my dad looking over to Harold Gould and goes, how my kid wants to be an actor. What advice do you have for him? You know, do you think he'll make it? I'm eight freaking years old, you know? <laughs> no pressure. And, and Harold Gould looks at my dad and he goes, he'll have to grow into it. Mm. Yeah, and so I've always been honest to a young actor because he was honest to me, even at eight. 
And and it's 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 really true. That's why I, it's practicing gratitude. It's practicing meditation. It's practicing yoga. And I love that word practice because it implies that perfection isn't the end result. Mm -hmm. That you got to be a process junkie in this business. Well, you got to enjoy the ups, the downs. You know, waiting for that phone to ring. It's one of the more uh, anxious anxiety uh inducing parts of the game well, and you, you gotta love it yeah absolutely you, gotta, you mentioned your yeah. dad you, i also read that your mom was a, was a librarian so did that yeah. influence a lot with you like well i guess that storytelling aspect a hundred a million percent a million percent i mean in Cur i was a, a voracious reader i was mm -hmm. way ahead of uh of of uh the curve of the average kid at an early age Mm. And I spent many, many, many hours in the library. Hell, I was a page in a library. I shelved a lot of books in my time. So, <laughs> but that is the art. The art is the storytell. Yep. Um, the nurses, the doctors, the especially teachers, they're the heavy lifters of society, our first responders. I mean, we know the, we know the spiel. The, you know, we always go, thanks for your service, but then we don't do a damn thing for the veterans right. kind of thing. And so it's really important for me to always remember that my job is really to entertain, to enlighten, to hold the mirror up to society for the heavy lifter. So the heavy lifter, the mortgage guy, whoever, whatever, the, that actually does the real work of our society that to encourage them to go back the next day and do it over again, the monotony of the, yeah. of, 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 you know, the way we punch a clock in modern society. Mm. And um, there was a game I used to play called Civ City Rome, this computer uh, civilization it. building game. I know Sim City, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the way to win that game, it's a way to develop your houses into the mansions that win and ultimately unlock, you know, the, the perfect Rome was after you build your little shack and you get access to, to fresh water, food source, bed, clothing, pretty soon after that, you need art. Mm. Pretty soon after the basic needs is where art and culture slide in to elevate and raise and encourage the development of the society. Mm-hmm. I always think back to uh, as a, as a theater student to the ancient days when this art of storytelling was sacred to society. And honestly, it was really the rise of the church, a rival theater company that that and they had incredible theaters. And then the Roman Catholics even offered like, you know, a wine and a wafer, here's a gift with purchase, come to our theater, you get a little snack in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages. You know, it was <laughs> 2000 years, no actors or dogs allowed, my friends. Right. Yes. We were vilified. We were vilified. And it was only the invention of the movie that raised us in probably too much into the mindset where now we are suffering from the cult of personality, hell. You're a TikToker and you're more famous than a guy that has 10 Oscars, you know? So we're a little out of balance now on that. We might need a tiny bit of a reset <laughs> in terms of what's really important because, you know, you got, I mean, hell, with, when the pandemic hit and suddenly everyone's taking pictures of their toenails and making a fortune, I'm feeling undervalued by society <laughs> i somehow missed out on that one i'm not quite sure it i know well it's me. not it's not new <laughs> but it's like I, <laughs> let me tell you something i i'm rushing for a pedicure at, as i speak you know? <laughs> well listen start out there. when you were when you were starting out who were um some of your other influences and what were your favorite movies that made you think you know this oh. is really what i want to do i mean I'm a TV and movie junkie, bro. So mm. I go all the way back. You name it, I want it. I I I wanted it. I mean, my hardcore, my hardcore influences were the golden age actors. Mm -hmm. Uh I mean, going to the theater, the the lights dropping down. Listen, I don't I don't really differentiate that much between, say, the theater where it was my roots and where I started 
and the film business, which I broke into at about age 23. So I was still pretty young when I got my first films. And I prefer film and TV. They pay you better. It resonates more when you hit a home run. It it hits millions, if not billions, um, as opposed to bringing your truth every night in the theater. But the essence of the game is the same. I was so lucky, dude. I had a, a number of people along the way that I could look up to when I was real young. My One of my besties, his dad was a psychotherapist and Rod Steiger was one of his patients. Oh, oh wow. So I used to go get acting lessons from Rod Steiger as Rod was unwinding from a tough session of his ego with Dr. <laughs> George. And uh, and then in high school, I kind of went to high school with some famous kids, you know, and uh, so Martin Sheen was always a big uh, inspiration to me because Emilio was one of my besties. And I could just, and the, the bottom line is Marty is Marty. When you see the people at home uh, making a burrito, you know, at dinner time, everyone puts cheese in their burrito the same way. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. and that broke down these walls. And then the ultimate, the ultimate moment happened when I was in college at UCLA, where one of my best friends was Richard Olivier, son of Sir Lawrence <laughs> Olivier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get to, I get to perform as a 19 year old for Sir Lawrence Olivier and then go to have lunch with him. Richard was the director and we go to lunch and there's this nervous, anxious kid uh, shaking hands with a legend, right? A God to me, acting God. And I'm like, Sir Lawrence, so nice to meet you. And he's like, call me Larry, dear boy. <laughs> and and i just knew right then that the game is keep it real uh be 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 yourself the audience makes you the fans make you the fans decide whether it's art we're creating a commercial product we're telling a story for consumption and it's that relationship goethe talks about it in his defining uh, talking about the the Basics, basics of theater, what is important. It's that relationship. Without the audience, we're just a crazy guy saying words or we're on a Bluetooth, <laughs> right? The audience never even matters what an actor thinks. It only matters what the audience thinks the actor thinks. <laughs> I was doing that once upon a time show. In in a in a in a, an episode where I get my girl Grumpy gets his girlfriend he can't be with her it's Amy Ash. We're gonna ask you about that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we're in love. Yes. We're in love. We can't be together. And we have this scene where we're crying and we can't be together. We can't. Blah blah blah. All the romance, which thank God I got for once to play in my career. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, it was like twelve thirty at night on a Friday after a long week. And in the movies, they if you go longer than, let's say, 12, they'll make a second meal. We eat every six hours, and they make another one. So there was a lady off, off outside cooking tacos, and the smell of carne asada is wafting across the stage, and we're both starving. So the audience thinks, oh, I love you, I can't be with you, and really it's like, I need a couple tacos, and she's like, I need me, me a burrito. You know? <laughs> But the key is, I think this is a Lon Chaney quote, actually, about about uh, it doesn't matter what the actor thinks. Kind of put, not necessarily poo-pooing on the method technique, mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> you know, the, the Stanislavski, who was credited with creating the method acting, he wrote three books. Strasberg only had the first volume. It was the only one published in uh english for like 30 40 years so he he developed the method thinking oh this guy stanislavski has this method it's real you get into the character you recall everything well his other two books talk about the technical approach to the art and so in a way it's just part of the game to me acting technique is whatever works as long as your technique doesn't jam up the other actors Sure. There's moments to jump right into it. 
There's moments on Pirates where Jeff Rush and Kevin McNally and Orlando and Johnny are all in the midst of a great story as they're rolling the cameras. When they go action, we all drop into it. And on cut, there comes the punchline. So, so it's about the real trick and what we love about a great professional and the and the few moments in my career where I can see myself achieving this is when when the eyes say one thing and the mouth says another. Mm -hmm. Or when you don't even say anything at all and it's just in the expression. Yep. Those are the those are the moments of my own performances that resonate. Um, acting truly is something you don't want to get caught doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I did want to ask you about you. You mentioned some of your friends there, and uh, so I also read that you know you had other friends like you know Cusack and Tim Robbins. Yeah, you one of your first roles. How, how did that? Come my out? very first role. My very first role, Johnny. We I had a theater company that I Tim is Tim Robbins is probably like not only the he's like a big brother so he was a senior at ucla when i was a freshman and we kind of formed this company called the actors gang um okay. in college and um because we were being encouraged by our professors that the, the 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 challenge of 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 making a career is just to make art just to do theater just to do shows surrender the judgment just go do it it's a just go do it. it's a nike business just do it Right. And so we, we did. And Tim, God bless Tim Robbins, seriously, bro, because he is, he's one of the most loyal dogs in the whole kennel. He was a movie star straight out of UCLA and he reinvested it in, in me and, and in my friends through putting on shows, being an artistic director, committing his funds and his, his power and his influence over uh, his friends to now we have a 40 year theater. That's incredible. Wow. And so when I was, he did a movie called the sure thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where he met a young whippersnapper called Johnny C Johnny Cusack. I think Johnny was like 21, 22. So at that time, when he first came down to the theater, we would, we would, um, in 1984, the Olympics were in L.A., mm -hmm. and we were a young company. was probably in our third our third summer of doing plays, and we did a production of Midsummer Night's Dream uh, for the Olympic Arts Festival, oh. mm. and also went and saw other theaters. and We saw a performance by a company called Théâtre du Soleil, a French theater company that based outside of Paris, and they work in a in a style that's all white face, all character, created character, beautiful costume, uh, shows created through improvisation. And we started developing our own version of the quote, that style. And that started around 1984 and Johnny came. And so we used to uh, four or five nights a week, we would just get together and jam. You'd walk into the theater choose an image a character for the night we had thousands of costumes even then that we would pick through it's like being working at the goodwill you're going through the thrift store and, and building a costume and then we do full makeup and uh then we would come out on the stage no props everything mined everything physical you know and this technique the style was pretty sexy to young hollywood uh, because it was a an escape. It was an escape from reality. You know, I think the modern TV and acting, there's less and less acting in it. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. don't trust anyone to do accents. We find the real deal guy. No one's studying Croatian accent. There's a million Croatian dudes out there already that are mm, damn yeah. good performers, right? So we just hire a Croatian to play a Croatian. <laughs> Where's the acting? You know, it is one of my laments, actually, of the modern Hollywood. They don't trust us that we've that we're trained that we can, you know, we want to do the work. That was a miracle, miracle of pirates for me. Gore Verbinski going to London, casting Mackenzie way before he cast me, 
But oh, knowing that none of the other 300 dudes that read for Pintel um, were the right match for him. He was looking for his, the R2-D2 to match Mackenzie's <laughs> C3PO. And so I always say that the greatest miracle of, of that was they couldn't find short, bald, and crazy in London. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got the corner on that one. <laughs> I do. I do. And that was part of the market. Yeah. That was my yeah. type. I'm a good screamer. I played like <laughs> high energy sleaze bags, is my type. What's your type? I'm a high energy sleaze bag, baby. <laughs> Well, one of your first roles um, was on a sit the sitcom Perfect Strangers, and if you, that was my first you, TV, right? Yeah, you appeared in some of the the biggest sitcoms around. You were in Night Court, Roseanne, Seinfeld, Friends. Uh, how about those? What was what were they like to work for you and uh, work on for you? And what were your favorites? Well, I mean, I'll be honest. They uh, those were fun gigs. Those three camera shoots. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite of the ones, I mean, you can't beat the Seinfeld thing. You really, <laughs> I'm a Seinfeld fan. Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge super fan of the show. I watch them all, you know, to this day. Um, although I do think now, like we look at them now, and sometimes you cringe, like, how'd you get away with saying that? <laughs> you know, the, in the 2023 America versus the right, 1993 right. Oh. America, 30 yeah. years we change a lot of the stuff, but. <laughs> That Seinfeld was my number one of the sitcom, uh, for sure. Uh, they were so generous. The average sitcom is a little bit more protective of their stars, not really wanting to share the really the funniest material with the guys that mm -hmm. roll into the guest stars. Yep. Gary is such a confident. He gets, I mean, Jerry, Larry David, Larry Charles, these MFers really know comedy. They get it. And they're willing. The same same goes with the with the cast of Mike and, and Julia and, and Jason and stuff. That they're, they're not so protective of their stuff that they can't let the soup Nazi be the funny guy. They can't let Kenny Banya get a laugh, or they couldn't, you know, support Putty or the uh, these other characters. That's why this world resonates. Phil Morris, one of the uh, Jackie's, you know, the lawyer <laughs> character. Just some of the favorite bits of the show are the stars reacting to the guest stars. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and that so that you know the the sexiness of of getting to let it rip. I mean, we're I'm always a jockey. I love my sports. Okay, and uh, if I wasn't an actor, I'd be working in sports broadcasting. Mm -hmm. That would have been my second choice career. Um, because I love that. It's theater to me, too, with no script. Sports are so theatrical. Oh, absolutely. You mm. know, that you go to a you go to a basketball game, they lower the house lights and raise the stage lights. Same with a hockey game. Um that's all that's and, always a magical experience. I mean, even in theater, I you know, that's something that just, you know, boils the blood when that happens. So yeah, I get course. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And you know, as a young, as a young guy, uh, in high school especially, you know, I could have been on the wrestling team. I'm a burly guy, but I'd rather wrestle with your girlfriends in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, boy, I'm gonna make a smart choice, and you know, <laughs> um, but I always have a bit of a jock mentality to the game. Not, not in a competitive way because you're not competing with the other actor. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're looking for team building. Mm -hmm. You're looking for ensemble. We, right. we call it play. We call it play. It's never work, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, many, the, they pay you for the waiting in, in Hollywood. The acting you do for free because you yeah. love it. You know, and you respect you. That's exactly why I come prepared. You're going to sit in your trailer half asleep and knock, knock, knock. It's 4 a.m. Come, come bring your emotional vulnerability. Hmm. So that crew wants to go home. They work way <laughs> harder. I'm not carrying plywood for 12 hours a day and lugging camera. I'm in there eating a burrito, playing online poker, waiting for them to knock <laughs> at my door. 
you know? So again, you want, I always want to uh, bring the comedy for the crew. I want them when they wear a jacket that says Seinfeld to their deli to get a sandwich that someone's you work on that show. Yeah. And be proud of what they do. Cause they're the heavy lifters of the Hollywood community. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a teamster actor is what I call myself. Cause if I wasn't in the trailer, I'd be driving it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <clears throat> well, you mentioned but, the comedies. So I, I wanted to, did want to ask you about one comedy that you sure. are, which I I loved you in that. I loved the show. I loved you in that. The and I found it incredibly funny. You played Bobby G on the series Action oh, with Jay one, Moore. Dude. I remember that show, and like I said, you were great. Every time I read about it now, the the word controversial is used. So, can you tell us a little bit about that series? And did it really ruffle feathers in Hollywood? <laughs> Absolutely. But now we have to place things in history, like in the in that show was uh, I th 1999, 2000. Mm -hmm. So right at the same time, Sopranos debuted. Sopranos, which was passed on allegedly, I think, by CBS before mm -hmm. HBO did it. But suddenly edgy was in. Mm. Suddenly, that's what everyone was looking for. If Action, which was a show, for those that don't know, about Hollywood, yeah. it was basically Joel Silver's life story. Jay Moore played the basically the Joel Silver, but I think originally they wanted they saw Oliver Platt as the ideal guy. Mm. Basically about a producer who gets his movies made and all the machinations and, and, and everything. And so each season was going to be a different movie from start to finish was ideally the concept behind the show. And I played kind of, uh, I was the baddie, the studio head, member of the Velvet Mafia, literally the biggest dick in Hollywood. And, <laughs> so and, and, yes. and they go, and the way that they prove that is I did the first full, uh, full <laughs> frontal nudity on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Male nudity anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So and and it was kind of like this is the deal, you know. On the pilot, my character was was had a nice role, and it culminates with him me me taking a meeting with Jay Moore's character in the shower. <laughs> and this is has a lot to do with acting right here. My essence and what makes me tick is that everyone comes up to me, the director, Ted Demi, the late great Ted, and. Uh, the costumer and they're like uh well we have these little undies for you and we have this thing for you a weird some weird sock thing and i'm like dude i don't wear that in the shower <laughs> so if jay's cool i'm cool and i i want to say the courage of the mo of the actor is what saved me there that i will take i'll get naked for the character yeah, because this is the essence. Like this is the difference between the the amateur actor, the pro actor. Is you got to drop your self consciousness. We don't. You got to you got to see it from the character's view, not the actor view. As long as it's not unsafe, as long as it's not really outrageous that that affects the other players. If you you're just doing your thing, you're playing your character. So. They liked the fact that I dropped trow for them at the, no problem and was willing. No, I wasn't difficult is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. But it got me the upgrade. It got me to be, to be the guy for the, for the show, the baddie, you know? And so <laughs> I think a lot of times you just got to get out of your own way and get out of your own head, you know, as the performer. But that show anyway was, it was filled with bleeps. Yeah. So it needed to be on cable. Mm -hmm. Fox like bought it, yeah. it because they were searching for edgy fare. Hmm. But what two things that sank that show were, well, the most important one was that Columbia TriStar, I think, produced it and Fox was having to pay for it. So it was expensive. 
Um, but I thought it was brilliant. BBC Thank calls you. it brilliant, but canceled. Yeah. Yes. I did a series, brilliant, but canceled. Yeah. But can you imagine it was me and Buddy Hackett hanging out? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I got to hang with Buddy frickin' Hackett, okay? Yeah. Well. And he would and he would go like, wait, wait, want to come to my trailer and watch Love Connection? I'd be like, hell yeah, I do, baby. I would sit and watch Love Connection with Buddy Hackett. <laughs> <laughs> one of my heroes it's yeah. a mad 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 world when we talk oh, about yeah. movies that made me want to get in the game the great mm. race uh-huh great race i got to work with peter falk mm. um he was one of my heroes jack lemon hero mm. um and certainly every damn person in it's a mad 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 yeah. world those mm. were the those were the go-to movies uh when i was a kid I could watch them over and over and over. I still again. do. <laughs> <laughs> well, touch, we already started to touch on pirates, which is yeah. like now the go-to movie for so many people, um, including myself. So, Pirates of the Caribbean comes along for you, and you sort of talked how you um, got involved. But was it was it just another audition, or yeah. did they kind of know the type they were looking for? And uh, when I mean, you maybe. came on board. I mean, they did certainly didn't know me. I wasn't on the radar. In fact, when I went to mm. the when I went to the first audition, I was I didn't know that casting director at the time. And mm. I remember her I remember feeling like an outsider because I remember her coming up to a couple other actors in the waiting room and congratulating them on some performance. And it actually came at a time when I when my mind was telling me that I was a fucking piece of shit kind of thing. Mm. you know and i was coming off a bit of a a, a a slow period there was an audition uh funny that we brought up action which doesn't get brought up a lot but there was a, there was a threes company tv movie mm -hmm. that was made by nbc right around the same time this uh, that this the pirates was getting put together so they called for me they they wanted to put me on an offer to play the producer of Three's Company in this TV movie. Oh. Okay, that was Friday. So Monday was the audition. I thought I had it in the bag. Again, I'm not feeling that great about myself. So they go, we loved you in action. We want to bring that producer in, uh, that character kind of essence, Three's Company movie. Okay, fantastic. Well, I go to the audition and then there's one other actor there. And it's Dan Roebuck, and who I love. And Dan, I was like, I think you're better for this part than me. And sure enough, he got the part. So I go home super bummed out. It's one of those auditions, that movie, whether they told you right there, we pick him over you. Mm -hmm. mm. So I'm like a, a body slam. I'm like, oh, woe is me. Schlep rock, it's raining on me in Southern California. Beautiful day. I mean, again, it's all, lots of time, it's getting out of your head. <laughs> It's how you succeed, right? But I'm in my head fully, really feeling sorry for myself. And then all of a sudden, my fax starts going. Chick -chick 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 -chick. Pirate movie? Johnny Depp? What the fuck? This seems weird, you know? And yeah, just all of a sudden, there it was. Hello, pop it. <laughs> you know? and, it and that's the way I read it the very first time on the fax. Like I was mm. mumbling under my breath, you know? And I oh, and I, of course I wanted it. No one knew what a pirate movie would be like. That genre had been, you know, the yeah. Rennie Harlan, Gina Davis didn't do that great. It's probably been since the 1950s since there was a decent pirate movie made in Hollywood. Um, everything was going against us. But I go into the audition, then I get like where I'm not loved on by the casting director. You mm -hmm. know, all these Broadway actors, but. I don't, I separate that. When I walk into there, when I walk between the lines, I'm all business. Mm -hmm. And thank God, you know, thank God I made that first cut. And then I go to, uh, to have a meeting a couple days later with Gore, my callback. And it's just me and Gore and the casting director sitting in his office. And he's recording me on a little kind of, at the time, sort of beta cam kind of camera real high tech, sexy little thing. <laughs> and uh, we start reading the first scene. It's going good. And we get to the part where I, I know you're here, Poppy. Come out. 
we won't hurt you, right? And then it finally comes to the L.O. pop it. And then <laughs> Kira's character goes parlay. And Pintel, all of his menace, all of his swagger drops because she's invoked the one thing that I have to honor. Pirates aren't allowed to, like, swashbuck, rape, and rampage after they go parlay. Parlay was called. I'm like, holy shit. And it was the way I said what? dumbfounded like how do you possibly know this right gore goes that's it that's the uh, guy uh, mm -hmm. it was an aha moment and i was in there then for the next 30 minutes and he'd already cast mckenzie and he got really excited and he pulls mckenzie's headshot off the wall and and, and i take it and then i use the technique from the style that i was talking about about actors gang and I start playing to his headshot. And that was the part when I'm like, I'm telling this story. <laughs> I yell at his headshot. <laughs> but you, you didn't know Mackenzie before this. No. No, I didn't even know the office. I had no clue. Wow. Right? So eventually I watched British Office, became best friends. Literally was assigned by Gore the task of, you guys got to become best friends is what he mm -hmm. said to us. Right. Fortunately, opposites attract, and there you go. The rest is kind of <laughs> laurel. I mean, to inherit the mantle, to do a double act like that of Laurel and Hardy, of Abbott and mm. Costello, of the legendary double acts, to even be mentioned and whispered as one of them, uh, is a true uh, testament to the fact that you invest off the screen and it shows on the screen. So we had it. We we for, forged a really nice friendship of now third twenty years, uh, kind of based on a director's assignment. <laughs> you know? Well, well, this was the time before social media and all that. And, but I remember at the time reading all these articles that how worried Disney was. One of the things that you just mentioned because of the pirate movies, lack of success. But yeah. I also read how worried Eisner was about Depp's characterization of Jack Sparrow. Do you remember those conversations? Do you remember I don't, I mean, I wasn't privy to the conversations, you know, that are in the Disney Wars book. They've been written right. about now famously. Right. Um, about too many gold teeth. Are you drunk? Are you gay? <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't, I never cared whether he was gay or drunk or what his, the Jack Sparrow's sexuality was, but <laughs> You know, as the other actor, I was like, what the hell are you? Are you drunk? Or I mean, the character was so unique. This dude, Johnny, let me tell you something about Johnny. Johnny is so sneaky, long, smart. Mm -hmm. You know, he has that am amazing face that very few, a Barrymore profile, a legendary history, kind of like one of the more beautiful faces that have ever been on a screen. Johnny, for real. Mm -hmm. um, you could be the hardcore hetero dude and you're like, whoa, Johnny, I'm kind of <laughs> curious now. <laughs> a beautiful man inside and out. I'm team Johnny for life, yeah, you know, um, because he's the real deal. He's he's the one. He cares about the fan. There's so many beautiful qualities mm -hmm. to him. But one of the most amazing qualities is how he figured out that pirates were the rock stars of the age. Then he goes, well, who's my favorite rock star? It's fucking Keith. So that's where he got a lot of the imagery of Jack, the bandana, all the jewelry was from Keith Richards. But then this is the genius. He blended that with Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> he took Keith Richards and Pepe Le Pew and turned him into... Uh, arguably one of the greatest characters in movie history. Maybe not even arguably, just unquestionably, right? He got an Oscar nomination for yeah. a comedy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Comedy doesn't get recognized by the powers that be. We like, you know, they, they'll recognize a snoozy drama way before they recognize what, you know, the, an audience's love. For me, Top Gun kind of thing, it's a best picture. Anytime you win the box office, I don't care what it is, you should be throwing that in there because you're not respecting the audience, you know, when you don't recognize what 
what pop culture contributes. Mm -hmm. Right? So Johnny uh, deserved every bit of the acclaim. He I stirred the pot. Jack Sparrow and Darth Vader are probably the two most iconic characters. Yeah. Yeah. And and I will say that Johnny did, I think, have to pull a couple of the gold teeth out. But mm -hmm. allegedly in that kind of come to Jesus meeting they had, um, where they were gonna I don't know what you're doing. I mean, allegedly someone says, Are you gay? And Johnny goes, Darling, don't you know all my characters are gay? <laughs> and that's when Jerry stepped in because Jerry's the bomb. <laughs> I love me some Jerry Bruckheimer. He's the coolest dude, doesn't suffer fools. And, you know, I asked Jerry one time hanging out with him, I go, Jerry, how do you decide what movies to make? And he goes, I only make movies I want to watch. Hmm. And I was like, dude, that's it. Just goes with it. He has the, he just has it. And so Jerry allegedly, that's, this is all in the Disney Wars. Right. It's in the book, this story of the gay and the darling, don't you know all my characters are gay, which I love. <laughs> the ultimate comeback, you know, because it's kind of like screw you. And that's when Jerry goes, all right, Johnny, you're going to pull out some of those gold teeth. We're paying for your bit of your smile here. <laughs> you know, it's not like you're a rapper or doing a, doing a video um so give us give us something bro you gotta meet meet us halfway and then he said to the head of the studio this is why we hire a guy like this yeah. because we don't we can't do it and we need him and he's the shit mm -hmm. and so it elevated him into i mean he'd always been a in a very successful character guy for all mm -hmm. those years and he's he longed for it. That's why he quit 21 Jump and, and it would pick the quirky roles. He looked to Buster Keaton for inspiration. He is a deep thinker. We don't, you know, we now give him credit for being a deep enough thinker. Uh, those that know him do, though. We get it. You know? Oh, I, I mean, I don't I, personally, you know, I don't have to know him. I mean, seeing the work in that film and all so much of his work i mean edward and scissor hands for god's sake and in june when he yeah. that was his yeah. buster Keaton inspiration yeah. you know i mean it's where just, he goes he, yeah million percent bro yeah million I percent mean, million percent well you know it's such a great film anyway and we've got to give gore verbinski his due um for helming this amazing picture what was he like to work with as a director for you bad scientist <laughs> <laughs> most enthusiastic guy on in the on every day he led that like a real general mm. truly inspirational leader for the whole th 2000 members of the crew <laughs> craziest mf -er in the world dude i can remember gore <laughs> being dressed like the gorton fisherman <laughs> <laughs> Gordon Fisherman on you know when we had rain he'd have the yellow slicker and the whole thing what a character now listen they didn't believe in gore they didn't know what they had when we first mm. started filming pirates all the producers were there every day but you got to again remember the history he directed a movie called The Ring mm -hmm. horror flick that came out in October of 2002 we started filming late or maybe even September, late September, because we started filming the very end of August, early mm -hmm. September. So for that first three, four weeks, the producers were always on set all mm -hmm. day long. But suddenly when Gore has the number one movie in America for week after week of that uh, Halloween season, they knew they had something. He's the guy that created the Budweiser frogs. <laughs> Gore's, 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 you know, way into directing film. He was a very successful commercial director. Mm. He came up with that whole Budweiser frog deal that was mm. so huge for years. Dude's, dude's a genius, mm. right? So, but what was really remarkable about his was he cast me. Yeah, genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolute genius to discover me, right? Um, but he knew. Gore says this. He says this. He knew that casting the right people in the right role for a movie like that was the essence. And let's not forget Ted and Terry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
let's not forget writers ever in any conversation mm -hmm. about good material or great stuff. The writer's room of Seinfeld, probably second only to a show of shows <laughs> for legendary talents in one room, Larry Charles, yeah. Larry David, Greg Daniels, the list goes on and on and on of the people involved in Seinfeld. I'd compare it right to the nose with Buck Henry, Woody Allen, mm -hmm. Reiner, all the guys that wrote for Sid Caesar, you know, and um, Ted and Terry, OMG guys, Aladdin, um, Marcus Zorro, Shrek, all under their belt. <laughs> And Disney, and no one believed in pirates, which helped us so <laughs> much. Eddie Murphy haunted me. Don't forget that another thing that screwed pirates and made the studio worry was the 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 failure of Country Bear Jamboree, yeah. <laughs> which came out the year before. So here we had a movie based on a theme park ride. It's a pirate movie, a genre that hasn't been loved in forever, um, and so. We're going to invest all our eggs and we're going to do our our corporate tie-ins. <laughs> we're going to do our action figures for um, Haunted Mansion, our August release. And, and that, this is the most magical part of this equation, is when an audience, it shows the power of the audience, I should say, because... The that the fans made pirates the success by going to the box office. Sure. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of times, you know, they would market the movie like here, go to Taco Bell and get a little toy. Well, we don't even know these characters yet. So I'm I would see an ad for a movie that hasn't come out, go, I'm not going to Taco Bell for an Enchirito for a toy that I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> but that allowed that allowed for the success to happen. Sure. We were in the theaters for almost a full year. Mm. Pirates changed Pirate changed movies forever because when Pirates 2 came out, it was the first movie. We transitioned from the big movie palaces into the multiplexes. And Pirates 2 was the first movie that was on multiple screens mm. in one multiplex. And that was primarily because of the running time of the movie. The first Pirates was two hours, 40, 235, which denied the movie theater owners that extra showing. Right, yeah. So then they came up with the concept, the distribution wow. guys, who are also a key part of this equation. I um, mean, it takes a village to make a movie a hit. It takes the studio to sometimes get out of their own way, especially once studios transition for, to more lawyer and bean counters i like to say from the creative <laughs> types that that started hollywood um so you know that the proof was in the box office for that for the first movie and then after two three months we had the mcdonald's commercial with johnny smile and go he's the best damn pirate ever you know or whatever that commercial was that we with him just looking and giving that cheeky <laughs> dollar grin you know but it was cool to see it was cool to see all those things come together can you imagine working with 17 year old kira knightley right, right. Yeah. 17 <laughs> yeah. and bend it like beckham had just come out in the states too during the course of that that came out actually while we were filming she was an unknown superstar of untapped maturity of, of being able to hang in the testosterone fest that was <laughs> all dudes mm. her and zoe and zoe saldana let's not forget zoe in the first yeah. movie she's done pretty well for herself i, I would well. say so <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah well, you, you mentioned this you mentioned the sequel i just want i read something the other day which i i never know that none of is this true none of you knew that jeffrey rush was coming out in that last scene in the sequel is that is that true that's totally not true oh okay i was wondering <laughs> I mean, dude, no, it's it says it in the script, oh, and yeah. <laughs> and and we, you know, we get it takes an hours in makeup, right? So he's like, <laughs> yeah, that that what we didn't know actually right. <clears throat> was that Gore was going to fire a blank gun though, <laughs> when we're all supposed to look and see him, 
So he, he did scare the heck out of us with a, a blank gun with no warning to get, that's the reaction. Okay. Ooh, the truth of that moment is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the truth of the moment is, I mean, we were super excited to get Jeffrey Rush back. Right. Hmm. I mean, Jeffrey Rush is, you know, talk about an acting inspiration. He's the real deal, you know, in terms of his preparation, his professionalism, his, I mean, he's one of the most fun dudes you could ever work with. He's so generous. Um, and that, these, there's a lesson in Hollywood that whoever the number one guy is on the call sheet, whatever their behavior is, kind of dictates what the rest of the cast is allowed, how they're allowed to behave. And the professionalism of JD and Jeffrey and stuff is, non it's not questioned but they have a good time johnny chats to everyone <clears throat> johnny has full-on conversations with crew guys and then he right. he's the kind of guy that will be like hey you know two days later oh i found out the answer to that question we had and he'll remember <laughs> the dude's name that's the third assistant set <laughs> deck painter or whatever and it's that level of humanity that translates you know to me um as inspirational and as the kind of actor I want to be. Sure. Donnie's the first guy I ever heard say the fans are the boss. Hmm. And he would stay two hours after filming when we were in a location where fans had gathered. He'd sign for everybody. Pictures okay. with all of them. Hmm. So it comes you know, that, it's easy to root for a cat like that. Well, speaking speaking of that, him and everything, keep reading that there's going to be a six movie. There's not going to be a six movie, and that he's not going to be it. That he is going to be in it. Have you heard anything about it? And I mean, I've just heard it? the rumors. I haven't, you know, I don't believe it till they call me and offer me, you know, hard cash. Right. I'm a professional. <laughs> I hate to say, got to be a bit of a mercenary. You know, cheesy rumors are great, but. Right. I yeah. would think that they'd be fools not to do another one. They'd be fools not to figure a way to get him back for all the right reasons. Most importantly, from the studio and the shareholder and the stockholder and the fans of Disney perspective. I mean, they, people want it. It would be and, and you as well. I mean, you, you and Mackenzie were not, were not in the, the fourth and fifth. And I, 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 it was definitely a different tone in the movies. Yeah, than I thought we were missed. You know, I do too. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, by the fifth one, I was on Once Upon a Time, so I was right. again, you know, doing more another kind of Disney show. And Mackenzie's a huge star. Mackenzie's badass, right? <laughs> and so to not, I mean, me, I'm a working stiff. You know, Stan Laurel was the real talent. Oliver Hardy was more just a working stiff. You know, Stan Laurel was the writer. He was the genius of the two. Oliver Hardy was played a great character. It's a lot like me and Mackenzie. Mackenzie's definitely a deeper thinker. He's a writer. He's a and he's a huge, huge star in England. Huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Disney has to recognize that. Yeah. Which you know their their bottom line is you know, uh, I don't know. It's more literal, I guess. You know, it's not that they didn't respect respect us but show you know you got to show him some respect you got to draw him out seduce us baby <laughs> do you have me in hello I mean, i'm a hollywood guy a bit more desperate you know <laughs> he's got more talent well, you know <laughs> well, you, well you just mentioned something that my daughters will kill me if i don't talk about here yeah once, once. upon a time yeah <laughs> and it's funny my, my daughters love that show we just watched, we wa they've watched it many times. We just watched the Grumpy episode, the origin story last night. In oh, preparation wow. for this. So how did you get involved in that show? You know what? I, 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 I got called up. I got called up. I guess they actually did have their eyes on me. I think for the guy, as far as I know, I was the only guy that read for the part. So mm. um, again, great writing, great creativity. Uh, Kitsis and Horowitz, the creators of that show came out of the lost the Damon right. Lindelof kind of legacy room, another great writer's room of many, many hit shows. Um, the J.J. Abrams Club, if you will, that Losties, the Losty writer's room. And uh, yeah, it was just one of those things where I'm a, sometimes being short helps. 
<laughs> really does. And so I was eligible. I'm crusty. I play. I mean, again, the type I think evolved into crusty with a heart of gold kind of stuff, which is really pretty close to my no acting required to play the part. <laughs> and then, um, but what a brilliant, what a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant concept. There was a graphic novel called Fables, or there is, that's very similar, um, but they nailed it. Were these magical characters in the Disney fairy tale world cursed and sent to this horrible, horrible place, modern day America, with no <laughs> knowledge that we're magical? Mm. And then we find out at the end of the first season, and then for the next six years, we're just trying to get home. Yeah. <laughs> And two things here that are really important that connect both Pirates and Once Upon a Time and the power of the Disney fan, which is a huge fandom, obviously, was that the writers, Ted and Terry, and the writers, Adam and Eddie of Once, didn't change anything that the Disney fan already knew about the character. And in fact, in the first Pirates, they... They only thought they were going to get one pirate movie to make. So they threw the whole every pirate thing into the first one, not thinking they would ever get another bite of the apple. So there's at least five to seven homages to the ride in the first movie. <laughs> Gibbs is with the pigs, the dog with the keys, the music of the ride plays. And Johnny, when Johnny breaks into the Il de Muerta, he has the drop with the music playing, saying to the Disney fan, hey, guys, this is your pirates. We're not changing it. It's the one we've always dreamt of. The one that I used to go see when I was a kid. You have no idea how much a manifestation of a childhood dream becoming a pirate of the Caribbean was for me. <laughs> I'm a SoCal kid. Grew up going to the park. It was my favorite. You know? Uh, so, I... I've been re I'm really grateful that those moments resonate for me, that I'm aware of, of what's to be able to enjoy it along the way. You know, this life as an actor is challenging, but those are the payouts. Those are the moments of true connection. It's not about the car I drive. I mean, yes, I live on the beach. Very grateful to the fans for helping me achieve a nice life. But you know, it's the manifestation of the dream and it's what I share with my fans and with an audience about have a dream. Whatever makes you special is what you should be pursuing. It'll keep you happy and it will unlock, it will unlock what really, because the, the journey is the life. You got to surrender the outcome. You got to turn you got to turn that over to however you define the bigger picture in life. Your higher power, your god, whatever that is. I believe in faith. And I define faith as I'm able to stay at peace knowing I'm going to get what I want if I try. But I don't have to know how or when. I can turn that over. Mm. You well, know? I, I do have to ask about because again, my daughters absolutely love him. I have to talk about, about what was Robert Carlyle like, and was he was I read that he did a lot of pranks on set too. Yeah, Bobby's a Bobby's a bit of well, Bobby and Josh and Colin. I I'm not good at pranks. I never pull them because I don't like them pulled on me. <laughs> I I get embarrassed or I get mad, and you don't want me mad, and uh, <laughs> so I don't pull them. But yeah, those guys were. I mean, I'll joke for sure. I can take a joke. But, uh, yeah, they had a lot of fun. Bobby Carlyle is a legitimo genius. Hell, the guy was a Bond villain. Mm -hmm. And he gave such legitimacy to that show because he is a hell of an actor. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, the acting in Once Upon a Time might be the highest level cast I've been in. From, mm -hmm. you know, Jennifer Goodwin and 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 Jennifer Morrison Lana Perea, what a performance, elevated her to be a superstar playing that evil queen. And Bobby. I had a director one time when we I was traveling because I would commute back and forth, go up there when I was working and come back home. Being a recurring character, wasn't on set the whole time. 
but I would fly with the director one time and we were for season one early on. He goes, you guys are amazing. And I'm like, well, how's that exactly? And he goes, well, because you take lines like I love you and I love you a lot and make them sing. And a lot had to do with that, with that we really liked each other and we would hang out off screen. And it's the same thing that happened with me and Mackenzie. We were friends off the screen. So it resonates in the looks. And if you watch once, you can see that in my relationship to Ginny, to Lana, to J-Mo, to Josh Dallas. We're friends off screen. We're hanging out because we're all... We all got sent from wherever we were up to Vancouver. And then suddenly we're, we're going to make a family up there. And, um, you know, those are the moments for me that I make me love doing this business. That and the reaction when it clicks to an audience. When an audience takes it on like the oncers that are so passionate. Oh, definitely passionate fan base. Yeah. Were you told that it was going to end with season six? Because... It it that could have been the series finale where well you told it that was it and then it got renewed again. No, I mean, you know, honestly, I think truthfully, the the reason it ended after six was that was always planned to end for six because that was the contract length for the everybody. Okay. Hmm. The stars signed for six. That was the network deals. So they had already pre. Okay, we'll give us the best best six. Right. And then I think they were ready to end it with the bowing to Lana and her right. achieving, you know, the her rightful place back and us eventually heading back home to the magical fairy tale world. Um, and I think then I think the network wanted to squeeze one more out. So they decided <laughs> to try another one, you know. Um, and I, I think a lot of that one worked. And I certainly love, you know, getting to work with Andy West and all the great people that came on in season seven that were fantastic um but yeah the show had run its course you know i mean for me the best seasons were the first couple um but i did love the musical episode i thought it was going to be when it when it, when i heard we were doing it i said oh man we're jumping the shark and then it turned into <laughs> the greatest episode so much fun i think my favorite moment of that whole series was the dwarf conga line at the wedding at the very end seven dwarf uncles dancing we're so happy they got married well, one of the things that I read that everyone complains about there is that there was no resolution ever for Grumpy and Nova. So <laughs> were you told about anything with that? Was there going to be a happy ending at some point? I knew it wouldn't be a happy ending. We actually did a bonus deal for uh, the first DVD that came out called Good Morning Storybrooke. It was kind of like a Good Morning America that's right. a bonus on the DVD. And there they actually have their moment. And uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, um, Grumpy needed his pain to make him who he was. <laughs> that was his essence that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't the traditional Grumpy, the misogynist of the first movie. He was the one that ha his besties were all the hotties. It's the greatest job in show business, baby. I was best <laughs> friend to the hottest girls in show business for seven years. Um, and so, but he was capable of romantic mm -hmm. love. They're basically born as monks, hatched out of an egg, right. with a beard like a rabbi. And, um, you know, there to mine the diamonds that are ground into fairy dust that creates the magic of the world. <laughs> They're like monks, right? We're monks. Right, yes. My guy had the capability of the romantic love, and that's what set me apart. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was absolutely so cool. You know, and it, and I let it affect every decision I made as that character. Yeah. He cared. He cared about the people. He was a fighter. He was a great screamer. He was the town <laughs> crier. But <laughs> when push came to shove in those moments of her of heroism, when he was paired up with 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 Prince Charming and going to battle with Snow White, you could count on him. Yeah. Mm. And it's fun, you know, with all the baddies I've played, it's certainly fun to play a hero, you know, to get one or two good hero parts into the res. Will there be any <laughs> revisiting of that land in the future or or no? <laughs> I hope so. 
I hope so. You know, I'm sorry. I've got to just one quick text here. No problem. No problem. To my shrink, to be totally honest with you guys. <laughs> I got her. She's next up. My next Zoom is to Copenhagen with my brilliant. <laughs> Real, keeping it real, <laughs> keeping it real. Although I will say this: this a good Zoom interview is almost like a shrink session. <laughs> <laughs> you, you would be interested if they do it again. Yeah, dude. I, I mean, I like to work. <laughs> I don't think I've ever said no to any gig in my career. <laughs> I'm a character actor, right? I mean, I see myself as an actor that plays characters. Right, right. But Hollywood mm -hmm. sees me as a character actor. So I learned a long, and, the, and you mentioned Friends earlier. A buddy of mine called Seth Kurland, who I went to UCLA theater with and did was in early actors gang shows with. He was a writer on Friends. And he called me up and um, was lucky enough to tell me, um, hey man, I got this part. It's not a big part, but the Friends New York rarely intersects the Seinfeld New York, so I think you should take it. And my attitude was always like, yeah, well, they're going to pay somebody for it. I didn't. I don't judge by the size. I judge by, listen, I'll do one line. I'll say nothing, but you're going to treat me like I'm valuable, and then I'm cool. Mm -hmm. A character actor really is just an interesting color that this painting needs. Sometimes Monet went to that color for a whole painting. Sometimes that's the painting, right? But most often it's just that little point of color, of emphasis that brings out contrast. Um, you need a good obstacle in scenes. Every scene has an obstacle, an action, a goal, and an obstacle in every dramatic scene. And a lot of times my function is the obstacle. Mm. So you have to know your places. I think there's, there's where uh, being able to analyze a script having good teachers, teaching you about what we're doing. There's only two kinds of scenes. There's power scenes. There's seduction scenes. There's only 33 possible dramatic scenarios. Boy meets girl. Boy gets girl. Boy loses girl. So everything written, everything is based on something that's already been done. You know? So. And what are you going to be in next that we can look forward to? I don't know. I'm kind of like, you know, it's one of those times where I'm kind of in between the phone ringing. So I'm not 100% sure. I did a really fun movie in France last year, a short for a guy that I think is the Tim Burton of France. It's called Bloody Fury. It'll be on the festival circuit. He landed me. He landed Bill Nye, who's now up for an Oscar. He landed mm. Kevin McNally. Marty Kleb is in it. Kid from oh, yeah. uh, one of the kids from Harry Potter's in it. So Here's a young filmmaker who reached out on Facebook. Wow. And I kind of was like, well, let me see what you got. And I watched his other movies and I went, holy shit, you are amazing, dude. <laughs> Sign me <laughs> up. So That's I'm great. actually a live action character. Kevin and Bill at lend their voices. Uh -huh. So uh, I play kind of a baddie Western character, which was super, super fun. Oh, I love Westerns. Look forward to Kind that. of a French. Honestly, it's a crepe Western. <laughs> No, so it's not a spaghetti western. It's a great <laughs> western. <laughs> well, we thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. We are looking forward to this so much. And like I said, I'm a huge fan. And thank you, guys. I mean, honestly, this is maybe one of the best, strongest, well prepared, really fun interviews I've done. You guys oh. did your homework, <laughs> it shows. And I appreciate your being, you know, the opportunity, but more importantly, I appreciate your fandom and, you know, and your support too. No, we mm. thank right, you. Looking so forward much. to see. <laughs> I like, <don't> <laughs> like I said, I'll send it to you when we're done, but again, yeah. thank you so much. Again, this has been Jonathan Rosen with Ike Eisenman for Pop Culture Retro. And again, a very special thanks to Lee Arenberg. And please subscribe. Subscribe, Please, guys. You. I'm a pirate yes. for life, yo, peace. <laughs> thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast.